Welcome back to the Wealth Actually podcast, the show that features artists, entrepreneurs, experts, and commentators that will give you the right knowledge, planning, and guidance so you can preserve your assets and enjoy your wealth. Learn more and subscribe today at wealthactually.com. And now, here's your host, Fraser Rice. Welcome back to the Wealth Actually podcast. I'm Fraser Rice. Today, we're going to be talking about interest rate volatility and inflation. These are two major issues in the investing world. We're joined by a major expert in the field. Nancy Davis is the founder and managing partner at Quadratic Capital Management. She began her career at Goldman Sachs, where she became the head of credit, derivatives, and OTC trading on their proprietary trading desk. She served as a portfolio manager at Highbridge and served as in a senior executive role at Alliance Bernstein before forming Quadratic in 2013. Barron's has her as one of the 100 most influential women in finance, an institutional investor called her a rising star in hedge funds. As a reminder, this podcast is meant for educational purposes and is not to be taken as investment advice. Enjoy this interview with Nancy Davis. Nancy, welcome aboard and thank you for being on. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So I went into a little bit in your background about what you do, but why don't you take us through your background a little bit and give us a sense of the experiences you had and how that helped to get you to where you are with Quadratic. Well, I founded Quadratic in 2013. It's really been a lot of fun to start my own firm and build a great culture and a great team. Prior to starting my own firm, I had three employers. My first was Goldman Sachs. I spent the majority of my career there. I was there about a decade. I was a trader and uh, rose to become the head of uh, credit derivatives and OTC trading for the internal prop desk. Then I was a portfolio manager at Highbridge, which was a JP Morgan's hedge fund. And then I was more, I'd say, executive at Alliance Bernstein, which I definitely felt was very important to starting my own business. I like doing the portfolio stuff, not the management stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so maybe you come out of Alliance and you start Quadratic. Talk a little bit about that leap of faith. It's obviously rewarding now, but what were you thinking about at that time when you were doing it? I just, I'm one of those people with lots of big ideas and always to try and come up with solutions. And I definitely felt like at a big public company, it was just very difficult to get things done. And I think meeting to have another meeting to have a co-chair of this committee, head of this committee, I was just like, you know, felt like I was a little far away from what I love doing and what I'm exceptional at doing. And it's not politics and meetings, it's building businesses and creating portfolio solutions. So it just seemed like the very natural evolution. Having meetings to set up future meetings sounds like a slow death to me. So I know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely had days where I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? (laughs) It makes the clock run a lot slower when things like that happen. But there are a lot of great people there. Like I met a lot of great friends, a lot of great life influences. I don't regret my time there. I think it was a necessary step for me to take that entrepreneurial jump. It kind of got all my entrepreneurial bones going, if you know what I mean. So take us through IVA a little bit. What does it try to address? What is the theme that you're looking to deal with and what problem are you trying to solve? We're an inflation protected fund. The three problems that we were trying to solve when we created the ETF was number one, the measure of inflation that most people think about when they talk about inflation expectations is all going back to one underlying index, which is the consumer price index. And we don't think that's the only way to measure inflation. You know, it's sort of like if you had an equity portfolio and you owned the Dow Jones and you said, voila, I'm done. I own equities. It's just one index. It's not the only way to measure inflation. So we thought it was important to add another measure of inflation and inflation expectations not tied to CPI. Number two, tips by themselves, which are the treasuries with inflation protection, they are long duration. So tips will mathematically lose money when yields go higher. So if you actually had inflation, you had higher yields with that, you might not make any money, um, which we thought was a problem and something we were trying to, obviously we can't guarantee that we make money. It's in the future. It depends on a lot of different scenarios, but we at least have the possibility to. And I'm proud that our performance, you know, in 2021 
I've been struggling to find another bond ETF that's had positive performance in the first quarter with rising yields besides Ival. Ival has had positive performance despite the tips that we own, which are down year to date. So it's so far so good. And then the third thing we were trying to solve was kind of a broader problem that we don't think most regular investors realize that in their fixed income portfolios, they are short volatility. I feel like I want to shake people sometimes and be like, don't you remember the financial crisis? You know, So mortgages are a huge component of many of the core fixed income indices, like for instance, the Bloomberg Barclays Ag, which is what most active and passive managers are benchmarked to. The ag doesn't have any inflation protection. It has about 40% nominal treasuries, which are the treasuries with no inflation protection, but no inflation protection. And then about 28% of the index is mortgages. And the mortgage market has lots of fancy terms for short volatility, but some people call it prepayment risk. Some people call it the convexity correction. But at the end of the day, the U.S. homeowner is long the option to prepay whenever they want. Therefore, they're long the option. And the owner of the financial mortgage, you know, especially if it's in passive or active, it doesn't matter. They are short volatility because they're short that option to the homeowner. So I just think it's one of those things that I just don't think most people are aware that their fixed income book is so short vol. And that was something we were trying to solve for. So when allocators find their way to you, do they talk about what bucket they are trying to fill with your fund? You, to me, are solving for a couple of different problems, or in a sense, you're solving for one problem, but in a way that doesn't open up another can of worms somewhere else. How does that work when people are trying to either put a box around what you're doing or solve a problem within their own portfolios? We created the fund for the three reasons that I just articulate, you know, another measure of inflation not linked to CPI, not having a long duration inflation fund. We are long duration, but we have options inside as well that may potentially offset the higher yield environment. And then the short vol component that IVOL is a long volatility product. So it's not equity vol, it's fixed income volatility, specifically interest rates. The funny thing about the evolution of the fund is I think the more people hate fixed income, the more they tend to love eyeball. It's pretty funny. I think that you could draw a cross and the more people just like think the fixed income markets are ridiculously expensive. They don't want any corporate credit exposure because they see it as, you know, if equities were a dog, credit is a neutered dog. You know, it's still a dog. (laughs) It still barks. It still might bite you. And it makes sense because credit spreads and equities are related because it's all corporate. So when there's a bad management team or a bad product or a sector issue, equities tend to sell off and credit spreads tend to widen at the same time. So you might have stocks and bonds, but it might not actually be giving you any kind of diversification. So I think the funny thing is, is the more people hate credit, the more they tend to love eyeball. It's not why we created the fund, but I think the more people hate fixed income, the bigger weight they have of eyeball. So one of the things, it's a privately held opinion of mine, is that the idea of interest rate volatility or the idea that we could be in a rising interest rate environment, which that's a big assumption and one that I've incorrectly had for the last five years. But the people who had expertise in dealing with those environments, they've left the door. The interest rate environment has declined steadily over the last 30 years. I've got to thank those people who are used to larger rates at the long end. They're either retired or no longer with us. How much of an arbitrage is that for you? Do you find that the market generally struggles with dealing with these concepts? And is that one of the ways you kind of slip in and add expertise to what's out there? A lot of people think of eyeball and they think of higher yields, but it's not just higher long dated yields where the options can kick in. Obviously, higher yields are bad for bonds because the price goes down. But the options, they don't care about the level of interest rates. They just care about the spread between short and long dated rates. And so the interesting thing to me right now is that, yes, we've had long dated yields move to a more normal level, right? The 10 year is 165 basis points now. That's still assuming that you believe CPI is going to be around 2%. You're still locking in negative real returns that I wouldn't say that's a normal level. But 
more interestingly to me is that the rates market has started to price in hikes. And so the other way the options can profit potentially is if the hikes come out of the market. So set away another way, like lower front dated yields, but it's not necessary policy rates, it's expectations in the future. So like today, I'm just looking at my Bloomberg monitor. You can see in 2022, there's almost a full hike priced in. And then there are close to three hikes, additional three hikes priced into 2023. So for people who think, hey, you know, I don't think the Fed in any way is going to be hiking four times before the next US election, it could be attractive for those people too. So I think it's kind of cool because you don't have to pick a side. You just have to think something's going to change. And then that options capability that you have, that lets you, in a sense, have the optionality at each of those different time slots along the way. So you're not having to make a very long dated bet on that. Well, the reason that we use options to access this type of inflation expectation is going back to inflation does not have a zero bound. Inflation is not like a stock. It's you could have deflation. Inflation can trade negative. And so we like using options to access that market because we see when you buy an option, the most you can ever lose is the day you trade. It's a premium you spend. It's kind of, you know, I guess the best analogy would be like a debit card. There's never an obligation on the fund above and beyond the premium paid. And that gives you staying power, in my opinion, when you have inflation isn't going to be a one-way trade, right? It's very slow. It takes a lot of time. You want something where you can have kind of more of an asset allocation to inflation and inflation protection, but break-evens and inflation, it can, it sells off, it tends to sell off with equities. So like March, 2020, tips were down quite a bit. I've all ended up having a positive month that was from the options contribution. But I think the options can help potentially when you have market stress like equity selling off that typically leads to higher volatility across, it's not just equities that go as, it's typically all asset classes. Anything that has an options market has a vol market. It's kind of like saying a Kleenex or a tissue. It's really the same thing. It's just different terminology. In order to have an options market, you have to have a volatility market. So anytime you see an options market, whether it's on Apple or gold or interest rates or S&P, which is what VIX is, those are all volatility markets. So let's move back to a concept you brought up earlier, which is the difference between CPI and other measures of inflation. How do you think about that? I think for many listeners and myself included, we get told by the financial industrial complex that CPI is historically low, yet many other areas, maybe housing, maybe food, other components seem to be rising in price and things are getting more expensive. How do you think about that and what other ways do you measure it? And then how do you deal with that in the portfolio? I see the biggest problem with CPI is that a third of that index is defined by, and you can just Google it, Google Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI basket. You can see approximately a third of the CPI index is defined as shelter. And shelter, if you peel back the onion, is actually mostly owner-occupied rent and it's largely urban rent. So I think it's just a question of investors asking themselves, like, what impacts does a third of, you know, having urban rent or shelter in rent terms, does it matter? And I think a lot of our investors say, like, no, that's not the only way to measure inflation. And we use options to access the OTC yield curve. Yield curve is just a fancy word for interest rates at different points in time. And so there are lots of different types of interest rates. Even in the US dollar, you have Fed funds, you have OIS, you have swap rates, treasury rates, all these different interest rates have yield curves, which is just the difference of interest rates at different periods of time. It's sometimes referred to the term premia. So like today, if you look at the difference between the two-year and the 10-year interest rate out in the future, say out two years, because the market has priced in these hikes, the difference between the two and 10-year is less than 1%. It's currently 93 basis points. So that's the forward level of the yield curve. And that's what 
options trade off of forwards, right? It's not the spot level, it's what the tenor of the option is. So I think it's a pretty interesting market because it captures, you know, if you think about where people lend money, that's largely a result of the yield curve. You know, if you lend, have a two year loan versus a 10 year loan, and you lock up your capital for 10 years, you only get paid that difference at you know 93 basis points more to lock up your capital for a decade as a lender. And that's largely because the rates market is not pricing in inflation expectations in the future. But most people, when they talk about inflation expectations, they're talking about the difference between nominal and inflation-protected treasuries, which again goes back to the underlying consumer price index. It's one way to measure inflation. I just don't think it's the only way. And as a result, your fund is taking sort of a broader or maybe even a more refined definition of inflation and and really exploiting that versus the rest of the market. We're trying our best. It's hard to know where inflation is going to be, right? Like we've obviously had, I wish we could have a education inflation, you know, that would be awesome right? <laughs> way to trade that market. But <laughs> everyone could agree on that one. <laughs> we all have that risk if we have children or grandchildren. As we think about IVOL and you talked a little bit about what problems it tries to deal with, let's think about it in terms of some of the other asset classes that it could either augment or diversify against and maybe take us through some of that. You talked a little bit about traditional fixed income. Maybe just reiterate what you were discussing before. So some people use IVOL instead of having allocations to bonds with corporate credit spread risk. Um, That can be everything from investment grade, high yield, distress, levered loans, anything that has corporate spread risk. The reason that investors go into corporates is they want to have more of a monthly distribution beyond governments. IVAL does have an enhanced potentially monthly distribution. We've been paying out a distribution of 30 basis points monthly since we started paying distributions in July 2019. That's been a minimum of 30 bips, I should say, because we actually paid out 50 in December 2019. And that's something investors might be attracted to. Instead of taking corporate spread risk, this is essentially interest rate spread risk um, as another variable. We have a lot of model builders who just use it because it's not at least historically, it hasn't really been correlated to other stuff. If you go to our fund website on our materials tab, it's ivolletf.com, you can see we've at least historically had very low correlation to equities, to not even correlated to the VIX. It's not correlated to the ag historically. So it's just something different. And some people just like it for that reason, because it's not like everything else. I was going to say, one of the notions that I picked up from your materials is the idea that it could be a hedge against real estate prices going backward. Maybe talk about that for a little bit. It has nothing to do with real estate, but it is sensitive to interest rates. So for instance, obviously real estate's a very, very local market, but if we had long dated yields higher, that tends to hurt the treasuries that we own. All bonds tend to lose money when yields go up. And that can also be a more challenging time for real estate if you don't have, say, wage inflation, because for people who most people borrow money in the United States to buy a home and your purchasing power goes down, meaning you can't afford as big of a budget for a home purchase if you don't have wage inflation. So typically you have, you know, it's with the lag, but typically higher interest rates in long dated yields tends to obviously chicken or egg, which went, which happens first, but it could be potentially bad for property prices. Many professional real estate investors try to hedge rates and their risk is higher yields. But the neat thing about IVOL is we can also do well in lower front dated yields, which can also happen, you know, say we had a huge risk off event tomorrow. Obviously we don't know what's going to happen, but likely the almost four hikes that have been priced into the market will come out and that can potentially benefit the strategy as well because it's either higher long dated yields or lower front dated yields. So that kind of like risk off environment is typically also difficult for property markets because people don't want to be making investments and they're more trying to deal with day-to-day living costs rather than buying new properties. 
And I guess that analogizes somewhat to equities. If we move to a risk-off environment and you see a downswell there, IVAL could be positioned to be a natural, I guess, a hedge in some ways against that type of scenario. It's similar to real estate. Like we have nothing to do. There's nothing in the fund that's related to equities. It's not going to be like the VIX, which is equity volatility. I think that's probably more of like, if you remember the nursery rhyme, the tortoise and the hare, that is a hare that's very fast moving. (laughs) It's not going to move that much because it's interest rate fixed income vol. But typically vol tends to increase across all asset classes during these risk off periods. And then with the bonds, our long duration, you know, IVAL does own government bond duration from our treasuries. So those could potentially work if yields go lower. And then the options could potentially, if interest rates were zero in the future, like if nobody thought the Fed was going to hike, I think there'd be less of a cushion. But right now, because those hikes are priced in, I do think there is a cushion in case we get risk off for the expectations for front dated yields to go lower in the future. This seems like it could operate similarly to floating rate notes and that you're able to deal with depreciation when the interest rate curve steepens. How do you think about that? And is that something that you've brought up to other people? I think the big challenge that I see with floating rate notes is they have lots of credit spread risks. So yes, the coupon does reset higher with interest rates, but a lot of it tends to be uh, financials, so specifically banks. And so a lot of the risk, in my opinion, is actually credit spread, specifically financials. And a lot of the floating rate indices also have a lot of foreign or European banks. And so I think it's just really a question of if you own that just to benefit from higher interest rates, there might be other ways or different ways to get that exposure without having the credit spread risks. Interesting. And then finally, you mentioned it before, the idea of short duration bonds and where IVAL can help in a market sell-off environment. What other ways should we be thinking about that? Many people think short duration is a solution. And I think to me, short duration is kind of a misnamed strategy. It's not short anything. It really should be called less long because <laughs> even short duration is still long duration. So you're still you know, guaranteed to lose money if yields go higher. It's just a question of how much you're going to lose. And then the problem, because the two-year government bond rate is today 15 basis points, even if you have very little interest rate risk, a lot of these short duration funds have you know, they're full of all sorts of crazy credit strategies to get that yield enhancement above governments. So if you look under the hood, it might say short duration ETF, blah, 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 whatever type. But a lot of these funds, you know, 85% of them are credit risk. And a lot of them tend to be kind of the more I'd say trashy credits. <laughs> That's probably not a right. <laughs> no, I hopefully I'm not offending a corporate treasurer. But if you were a corporate treasurer, let's just think, and interest rates were, why would you borrow short term if you think yields might go higher, right? You'd be more inclined to lock it in if you think yields will go higher. So it tends to be the companies that can't afford the higher interest rates. And a lot of these funds have very, very low Like some of the funds, 50% of the portfolio is bonds with a triple B or lower rating. So I think the problem is, is you still have interest rate risk, even with short duration, and you might be adding a lot of other risks that (laughs) you might be reducing your interest rate risk, but you might take a lot of credit risk. And they have all sorts of things in there like asset ABS, which are asset backed securities, CMBS, commercial mortgages, student loans, auto loans, all sorts of stuff to get that yield enhancement above governments. But typically, you know, when you have equity sell-off, credit spreads tend to widen. So it might just be adding to your risky equities. Well, and it goes back to the notion that you've really got to, in some ways, look at the prospectus to see what you own. It reminds me of the money market funds back in 2008, and people look in and go, wait a minute, I have AIG credit and Lehman credit. That's how things break the buck. And so it sounds like, you know, certainly given the idea that your the underlying positions are in tips and options related to the rates market, that you have a steadier hand on the wheel of analyzing what those credit risks are. It's a different type of risk. And I think it's not appropriate for everybody, but I think it's, you know, for some people, 
different is good. You know, it tends not to be at least historically correlated to other things like corporate bonds or equities. So, you know, obviously correlations can always change and history is history and future performance is unknown. But I think a lot of people are saying, look, this is a more elegant solution to other things and it gives us something different in the portfolio. And I think a lot of people are looking for different right now and coupled with the whole reflation theme with the pandemic and the average inflation targeting and fiscal spending and blue wave, like the list goes on and on and on. on. It may, you know, who knows whether we're actually going to have inflation, but it might not be a bad time in case they are successful. As you look into the crystal ball or try to chart out what's happening in the next month or two, what are the two or three data points that you have on your radar screen right now? I'm very focused, obviously, on economic numbers and what the CPI prints are going to be, whether they're going to be higher or lower than expectations, what unemployment is. But I think the nice thing about having a strategy like Eyeball is I think it's one of those things where you don't necessarily have to time it because having inflation in your portfolio, most people don't have it, especially if they're using core bond managers like that are benchmarked to the Barclays Ag, it's not in the portfolio. So I think a lot of people just say, look, I'll take my core ag portfolio and augment it or complement it by adding something that has long vol to offset the mortgages and something that has inflation potential protection. Obviously, we don't know what type of inflation it's going to be, but use it as a complement rather than a replacement. So as we wind down here, I have a question that I think represents a really interesting and I think a cool choice you made in establishing your fund. And that was the idea of going via the ETF route as opposed to maybe a traditional hedge fund partnership or a similar type of structure. What was your thinking behind that? And it seems like it's been a terrific success so far. How has that played out and what are your plans going forward? It's definitely something that we did because we thought it was good for our investors and good for clients. It's the ETF wrapper. It's ETFs are 40 ac funds, similar to mutual funds or 40 ac funds. They just are, I'd say, the newer type of 40 ac fund. And ETFs have kind of two main types. One are passive funds, which replicate indices. And others are active funds like Eyeball, where it's actively managed, just like a mutual fund would be actively managed. I really think the active ETF wrapper is a great wrapper for investors. It has much lower fees typically than other 40 ac funds and obviously much cheaper than private funds. There's no incentive fee. The ETF issuer pays all the fund expenses, which I think is a great thing for investors. So the audit, the admin, the custodian, all those fees in a private fund are on top of the manager fee. They're considered fund expenses and they're paid by the fund investors with ETFs or flat fees. So no incentive fee, lower management fee, the fund expenses paid by the issuer. And then also you have the transparency with ETFs or mutual funds. You can see the fund's holdings. Mutual funds vary on how often they disclose it, but Eyeball is active transparent. So every day the portfolio holdings are updated. And so you can always know what you own, which I think is a great way to partner with investors. So they know what we have. And I think giving that transparency to investors is something I feel really happy about doing. I feel like it's a way to have a better partnership. And then also the tax efficiency with ETFs using that ETF technology, at least for in 2020, we tried to do Our bond trading in kind, which is there are two ways to trade ETFs. You can use the secondary market, which is trading it like paying a bid offer to a market maker, or you could use the primary market, which is how when you buy a mutual fund, you trade it at the NAV. ETFs also have a primary market, so you can execute at the NAV or execute in the secondary market. And at least for 2020, we tried to be very focused on real return, and we did our bond trading in kind. So our capital gains tax for 2020 for Eyeball was zero, which I'm really proud of. And I think it's really taking advantage of that fintech around active ETFs to be, you know, give investors better outcomes. And I think when you focus on your clients and you focus on improving outcomes, that's good for everybody. It also feels good. 
This is a tremendous education. Nancy, thanks so much. What's the best way for listeners to find out more about iVol and Quadratic? Well, we have a pretty informative fund website. It's iVolETF.com. All of our materials are on there. The portfolio is on there. It should be pretty helpful. Also, Google it. There's a lot of commentary out there on the fund, which is always helpful. And most importantly, talk to your financial advisor to see if I've all, you know, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm a portfolio manager. So see if I've all is maybe something that's appropriate for you. Terrific. Nancy, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Great to catch up with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Wealth Actually, hosted by Fraser Rice, author of the book Wealth Actually and a leading 